Unfortunately, many men misunderstand the hadith about uh, about sexual rights uh, and they misuse and abuse it. And they understand from it that the man has unconditional rights to engage in intercourse. And this is simply not the case. There is a genre of hadith and they are authentic. You cannot really deny them unless you deny a hadith. Uh, there's numerous a hadith, uh, almost to the point of it being mutawatir, that of the rights of uh, the marital relations. And by the way, uh, before I even quote these a hadith, dear brothers and sisters, no marriage is gonna flourish if you are worried about what is the minimal, bare minimal requirements. It's not gonna flourish. The sharia has come with law. Marriage is based upon love. Law and love are two separate things. You have to understand this point. The Sharia is giving you the basic bare minimum requirements, but no marriage is gonna function if you look at the bare minimum requirements. A marriage needs more than law. And the Sharia is not there to teach you etiquettes and manners, at least when it comes to the fiqh books are not there. I should, I should say the fiqh books are not, are not there to teach you etiquettes and manners. The fiqh books are books of law. And books of law are dry cut and paste rules. And so for example, it is law that the man has to provide uh, sustenance and food and drink and a roof over her head and clothing upon the wife. It is a requirement, even if he has an argument with her, even if he's in a bad mood, even if uh, you know he is suffering anything else, no matter what happens, the man can never, ever, ever deprive his wife of safety, of the uh, uh, roof over her head, unless of course he doesn't have one, then that's none of the case, but I'm saying if he has wealth, then he is obliged by the Sharia ah to make sure that his wife is living comfortably in accordance with the income that he has. He cannot just wake up and say, ah, I don't feel good, I had a bad argument with her, you know, I'm not gonna give her food today. No, it doesn't matter what argument has had, doesn't matter what bad mood he is in, he is required to provide his wife a, uh, a level of a living that is um, uh, in accordance with the income that he has. Now, what is then the flip side that the law says? And this is law, it's not adab, it's not any love, it's the law. What is the flip side? If the man is required by law to make sure that his wife is fed and taken care of and protected and safe in her house and she has her own place to live, if he is required to do this regardless of what else is happening in his life or how mental pressure he has, or even if they've had an argument, he cannot deprive her you know, uh, uh, of that. And our Prophet explicitly said that the right of the wife upon the husband is that you know he does not abandon her anywhere except in her own house. If he wants to leave and he's angry, he doesn't abandon her in the middle of the street. He doesn't abandon her in a strange place. If he wants to walk away because he's so angry and cool down and whatnot, the only place he can do that, she's in the safety of her house. He walks away in anger. In this case, for a while, he can calm down, no problem. He can never abandon her in a strange place. Now, if the requirement is that upon the man, what is the flip side? What must a woman do legally speaking? King. And this is where all of those ahadith come that, again, let's be honest here, a lot of people are very uncomfortable at these ahadith, and a lot of our sisters and brothers, they don't like even quoting these ahadith, but it is law, it is not love, and law is separate. You need to understand these ahadith in the broader picture and philosophy of what the goal of these ahadith is. There are multiple ahadith that, uh, when a man wants his desire to be satisfied and he calls his wife, unless she has an excuse, she should respond. That unless she's genuinely sick or menses or you know severe headache or whatever, or very tired because of the long day, whatever, if she has a legitimate excuse, that's between her and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If she does not have a legitimate excuse, then the hadith are very clear that the angels will get angry at her, the angels will curse her, that she is not fulfilling her wifely duties. Now, these are authentic hadith. Nobody can deny them if they accept hadith. And again, as I said, these hadith are law. What it means, just like there are certain things the man must do, regardless of how he feels, he must provide for his wife. So there are certain things that the woman is required to do by law. And the number one thing on that list is availability for intercourse. That uh, when the husband uh, does want to satisfy and the Sharia has viewed, this is the Sharia of Allah, the Sharia has viewed that uh, the harm that might come uh, for not satisfying a man's desire is worse than the irritation or the nuisance upon the wife. So she should obey for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, all of these ahadith, they are between a woman and her Lord. If she refuses her husband, then the repercussions are gonna come upon her. And those repercussions include that the angels are gonna curse her, the angels are gonna make dua against her, whatever that might be. But notice, 
If a woman decides that she is willing to face that wrath, that's between her and Allah and the husband has the right to criticize. The husband has the right to tell her, this is not right, this is not going to be a flourishing marriage. But he cannot do more than this. He cannot force himself on her physically. And that's something that is from these hadith because the Prophet literally said, if the husband uh, tosses back and forth angry, then the angels are going to curse her. He literally says, tosses back and forth. He didn't say, A'udhu Billah, he forces himself on her. No, he is not allowed to physically force himself on his wife because that is going to be a type of harm and a type of psychological torture and a type of inflicting of pain that is not befitting of human decency, of karama. And our Prophet wasallam said, لا ضرر ولا ضرار. There should be no harming of others, nor should you yourself be harmed. There should be no harming of others. And to force yourself in this manner, in the most intimate of acts, to force yourself. Uh, this is something that there is no question. It is a psychological trauma. It is a physical trauma. It is a pain of the body and the soul and the mind. And there is no way that this is something that is allowed in our Sharia. Ah. Yes, the wife should not say no. But if for whatever, meaning if she doesn't have an excuse, but if for whatever reason she does that, then she has to face the consequences with her Lord. And her husband has the right to speak up. And the Quran does give three steps, which is the famous verse of Surah An-Nisa, which uh, does definitely require another question and answer. I'm not trying to avoid that, but I don't want to go down on that verse now because that is a whole different you know, issue that we need to discuss. But the three steps that are mentioned in Surah An-Nisa, that uh, the woman and the, the primary context of this verse is about a lady who constantly refuses to engage in intimacy. That's the context of this verse, and that is the primary meaning of this verse. If the lady constantly refuses is to be intimate with her husband. Number one, Allah says, advise her. Advise her, fa'iduhunna, right? Uh, tell her that this is marriage is not going to flourish this way. I mean, it's not fair. What do you expect me to do? Uh, marriage has to be based on love. You know, fa'iduhunna, ask her of her rights of, the, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, leave her in her bed. So abandon her. You go to the bed, uh, to the living room and you leave her in the bedroom. You make her understand that things are getting serious. The third uh, thing that is mentioned in the Quran, uh, my philosophy or my fatwa is that in the cultures that we live in, this is an option, A, B or C, it's not wajib. If you have to get to C, my advice is jump over C and move to divorce. Then if it's really not working and it's not, and you're not able to get to the marital happiness, fa'iduhunna, wahjiruhunna, and then in the society and the times and the cultures that we live in, resorting to option C is going to break the marriage. There is no point of option C when it was done in other societies and times, it might have saved the marriage. In some cultures, option C might have saved the marriage. But in the cultures, I'm talking about Western cultures in particular, I'm not speaking of any other culture, but definitely the Western cultures that we are born and raised in, option C is going to completely break the marriage. It's not going to flourish. So if there is no hope from option A and B, jump over option C and then Bismillah, the marriage is not working out. It's not obligatory to remain married. And so Allah will take care of each one of them and find their happiness. Don't know in, uh, don't prolong the marriage when it's not working out. The point being though, that even in these three options, even in these three, you are not allowed to force intimacy on your spouse. Think about that, right? Even in these three, there is no option of forcing intimacy. You cannot force intimacy on your spouse. Rather, you encourage, you entice, and you uh, remind. And then if it gets really bad, you you know sleep in the living room or you, or, or you uh, leave the bedroom for a while. And also arbitration and other things can be done of this nature. And uh, as well, sisters should realize that uh, intimacy should never be used as a weapon uh, in an argument because uh, that is something that is just going to go down a very uh, negative route. Just like the husband should never use uh, these ahadith as a club to, to beat his wife with, like metaphor metaphorically beat his wife with like, you know, don't do this or else Allah is going to curse you or whatnot. No, these hadith are meant for women for their iman and taqwa. They're meant to incite their iman and taqwa. They're meant to cause them to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Women are reminded that they have a wifely duty in the eyes of Allah. They have a relationship with Allah. For the sake of Allah, they should, uh, you know, uh, uh, obey this one aspect of their husband. That's something between them and Allah. If they, for whatever reason, uh, choose to not do that, 
there is no forcing of this act on uh, the wife. It is something that will be considered a harm and a sin because you are inflicting a pain, an emotional trauma on another human being and you're not going to ever have a marriage flourish in this manner and you are harming another Muslimah and you're doing something that is not allowed and this is something that is explicit in the book in the books of our